Uh, this month we are doing uh, the series for February, which is the excellence of love. And I understand today being Valentine's Day, uh, you know, we kind of tied that in. But in, in, in 1 Corinthians in, in chapter 12, Paul starts writing about the importance of spiritual gifts that are given by the Holy Spirit. And it also talks about the body of Christ, how we are all part of the body and the harmony uh, uh, amongst the body is, you know, we need each other. There, every one of us is a different part of the body. Uh, everyone has a different function. Uh, we use our gifts to begin to edify the church. And it's just the harmony that comes from being a part of the body that there's a need for each other so that we can also care for each other and grow with each other. And in 1 Corinthians 12, 31, Paul writes here, he says, well, you should earnestly desire the most helpful gifts. He says, but now, and then he tells us here, he says, but now let me show you a way of life that is best of all. And he just ends right there. That's the end of chapter 12. He just kind of leaves us with a cliffhanger. It's kind of like you're watching your favorite TV show, and all of a sudden at the end of the show, it says, to be continued. And that's exactly what Paul says here, but let me show you a way of life that is best of all. And he just ends it right there. He says to be continued, to stay tuned for chapter 13. See, in chapter 13, because he talks about, let me show you a better way, of the best way of all, he starts to talk about love here. We talk about it as being the love chapter. He gives an explanation and understanding of the importance of love and how important love is in our lives, especially our love for one another. Pastor Matt preached last week on what is love. He began to talk about the agape love and the different areas of love and how we should express that love. And as Paul is talking about love in chapter 12, he says, he begins in 13, I'm sorry, 13, he ties 12 and 13 together. And he, he talk, again, he's talking about the gifts, he's talking about the church, and he's talking about the, the love. So our series scripture is here in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, in verse 13. And he sees, says, these things will last forever. Again, he talks about the spiritual gifts in, in chapter 12, he talks about love in 13. And he says, these three things will last forever. It's faith, hope, and love. And he says, and the greatest of these is love. He says, yes, that these, two, these things are going to tie together. These things will last for together to, forever, is which faith, hope, and love. But he also says that the most important thing, the greatest of these is love. In Hebrews, I mean, sorry, in, in, in 1 Corinthians 13, 2, he says, if I had faith that could move mountains, but if I didn't love others, he says, I would be nothing. So he says that faith is, will last forever, but if it's not tied in with love, he says, I would be nothing. Tonight, we want to look at uh, this uh, title of this sermon is To Live by Faith. In Hebrews 11:1, 1, faith shows us the reality of what we hope for. It's the evidence of things that we cannot see. See, we trust God for a future that we just cannot see. We trust God for our lives, our marriages, our children, our careers, so many different areas in life that we trust God for, but we just don't know how God's going to do it. We don't know how God's going to bless us in these ways, but we trust that he'll do it. It talks about those things that we hope for, but the things that we can't see because God is the one that will bring it to pass. See, before we were saved, you used to think that if I was a good person, you know, so I always thought if I was a good person, you know, you, you know just do good things, work, took care of my family, did a little bit of you know, charity work, volunteered, and just lived a basically a good life, that that would be enough. That that would be enough to make it with heaven because that's what the world told us. You know, just be responsible, be productive, be good enough. I remember having a conversation with somebody at work one time and he just couldn't understand the fact that the, the need for salvation. And he said, you mean to tell me that, you know, you got this one guy that's, you know, doing good and doing all these, you know, and taking care of his family and you got this horrible person over here and this guy gives his life to Jesus and he's gonna make it to heaven and he's not? I go, well, yeah, that's what the, the word of God tells us. In Titus chapter three, he says, he saved us not because of the righteous things we did. He says, but because of his mercy. He washed away our sins, giving us a new birth and a new life through the Holy Spirit. It says it wasn't because we were a good person. It wasn't because we were given to charity. It wasn't because, you know, we volunteered or we paid our bills or, you know, we were just good. It said it was because of God's mercy that we were saved. Ephesians 2 8 it says for by grace you have been saved through faith and this is not from yourselves it is a gift of God it's not by works so that anyone can boast it's not what we did it was what God did for us but see before we say we didn't know any of this Many of us, like me, were just religious. We didn't understand the need for salvation. We didn't understand the need for Jesus in our lives. The only thing we knew about Jesus is he was on a cross in our house. Or he had, and we had a picture of Jesus in our house, and that's all we knew about Jesus. We didn't understand it. We were religious. 
I shared the story before that my parents had this big old Bible in a box in their closet they never took out. But that's as far as it went. We didn't understand. We didn't know the need for Jesus in our lives. We didn't have a personal revelation of his gracious, merciful, loving God. We didn't know who he was. That God had a plan for our lives until somebody witnessed to us. Somebody came and told us about Jesus. How God wants to give us a better life. The promise of eternal life in heaven by believing and receiving Jesus. It was by grace that we were saved through faith. Not because of anything we did. See, we couldn't see him. We couldn't see God, but we still believed what we heard. We were told if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you would be saved. And that's exactly what we did. We opened the door to our hearts and our lives and gave our lives to Jesus, and we came into a relationship with the gracious, merciful, loving God. Romans 3.22 tells us, we are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who you are or what you've done. That's not that I added that. But it says it's, it's true for everyone who believes. It's true for everyone. It doesn't matter who you are or what you've done. It says Jesus Christ came to, to, to give us a new life. Why? Because we put our faith in him. Hebrews 11, 6 says, and, with it, and without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. As we come into a relationship with Jesus, we need to begin to live by faith. If we're going to please God, we need to trust him for everything because he says that he rewards those who diligently, who, who sincerely seek him. And we come into that relationship now, we begin to live by faith. See, we, need no, we no longer need to put our faith and our trust and whatever it was that wasn't of God. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness and all things would be added to us. It's rewarding those who earnestly seek him. See, we're used to doing things our own way. See, in our minds, we remembered all the times that we've been let down. People, you know, say, oh, you know, you've got me out, but I've been let down so many times. Been disappointed, you know, hurt. And it's hard to put faith in someone because of all the disappointments, all the letdowns, all the hurts. So when people say, now you got to put your faith in God, it's kind of hard. It's kind of a struggle to do that. What happens is we have that fear of being let down. But again, we need to understand without that faith, it's impossible to please him. We know the story of Matthew 8 where the disciples and Jesus went into the boat. It says that Jesus fell asleep and all of a sudden this great storm came and started to beat upon the boat. And his disciples in verse 25 says that they went and they woke him up saying, Jesus, Lord, save us. We're going to drown. Woke him up full of fear. And Jesus asked them and responded to them, why are you so afraid? Why are you worried about it? Don't you realize who's here with the boat with you? He says, you have so little faith. He got up, rebuked the wind and the waves, and suddenly there was a great calm. See, a fear will affect our faith. We know the story of Peter, how he walked on water. As Jesus told him, he said, bid me to come out to you. Jesus started walking on water, but then he started looking around. What happened is fear came upon him, and he began to sink, and he started crying out to Jesus to save him. And Jesus asked him this question, why did you fear? See, when we talk about living by faith, if we're going to live by faith, there needs to be a transformation. We got to go from fear to faith. In Romans 12, 1, it says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. It says, don't conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what, is God, what God's will and is good and is pleasing and perfect will. See, it's going to take faith in God to turn your whole life over to him really is. It's going to take faith to say, God, here I am, Lord. Make my life a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to you. He says transformation. He says renew my mind. Lord, that you would remove my, my mind and change the way I think, not like the world thinks. I want to begin to think on those things that are above. I want to begin to seek and know what your perfect will for my life is. It takes faith to say, God, here's my life. I surrender it to you. 
God, I want to forget all those things that have caused fear and have affected the way I lived, have affected the choices that I've made in life. Crowd to God, Father, transform me from the person who was so full of fear to a person now who lives by faith. So many have tried to change us, and they failed. We've tried to change ourselves, you know, self-help books and all these different things, but we failed. It's God who transforms us into the man or the woman he wants us to be. Ezekiel 36, 26 says, And I will give you a new heart, and I will put a new spirit in you. I will take out your stony, stubborn heart. How many used to have a stony, stubborn heart? Amen? Amen. How many still have a stony, stubborn heart? Praise the Lord. God's talking to you tonight. Amen? Amen. Praise God. But he says, I'll take out your stony, stubborn heart, and I'll give you a tender, responsive heart. A responsive heart that's willing to live by faith, willing to respond to his word, willing to respond to the conviction of the Holy Spirit. It comes through transformation through God that comes and begins to change our lives. That's living by faith. Say, God, here's my life. Take out this stony, stubborn heart, Lord. Turn it into a heart that will respond to you and your word, to respond to your conviction, Lord. So we talk about living by faith. We need to understand that there are no days off. In September of 2009, at the time was the world heavyweight champion, and they, they were... They're two brothers, but it was Vitaly Klitschko. They were the Klitschko brothers. They were heavyweight champions. And Vitaly Klitschko was going to fight a local upcoming fighter at Staples Center. They gave him an opportunity. He's a young man. I want to give his name because he's local, and I don't want to come looking for me, amen? But <laughs> maybe you might know him. But those who know boxing know who I'm talking about. But he was a young guy. He was coming up, and they had a big fight in, in, in Staples Center. They're making a big deal. The local kid is going to fight the world heavyweight champion. This young man was given an opportunity of a lifetime to fight for the heavyweight title, heavyweight uh, boxing t- uh, title. But what they do is, you know, in, in, you know, you watch the, the, the pay-per-views of boxing. They always do a pre-story of the fighter that's coming up. And in the pre-fight story, they began to show, you, show the story of this young man And what they did is they showed his training, or basically the lack of it, because this young man was very, very undisciplined. He talked to his trainer, and his trainer was so frustrated with him because he has no focus. He takes days off. When he does come and train, after he's done training, what he does, he takes his whole family to a Mexican restaurant to get tacos. They interviewed him, the kid, and he goes, you know, I know I'm supposed to train harder. I know I'm supposed to be on a strict diet, but I just love tacos. That was a big joke at work after we, because we, we all had seen the fight and everybody goes, man, I just love tacos, you know? But that was it. He was so undisciplined. He, he just, he, he, he would take days off. He wouldn't put in the time and dedicate himself. And what happened is he put up a pretty decent fight, but Vitaly Klitschko put a beating on him and where they had to actually stop the fight. His, his coach actually stopped the fight in the 10th round. He said, no, nah, he's done. And in the post-fight comments, Jim Lampley, Jim Lampley is a, is, a, is a commentator for boxing. I don't know if he still is. But he made this comment, and he says, memo for anybody who wants to challenge the Klitschko brothers for the titles. He says, these are 365 day, days a year, guys. They do not take a single day off from their dedication to the craft of boxing and to the conditioning necessary to be their very best and as they get into the ring. And then he took a shot at this young man. He says, anybody who thinks he could take 10 days off to have fun, party, drink, and then come back and get in the gym and get on the same page is not going to beat a Klitschko. It's as simple as that. Basically saying, if you want to challenge a champ, there are no days off. And it goes the same way for us when it comes to living by faith. There are no days off. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 24 Paul's writing here, and he says, don't you realize that in in a race, everyone runs? He says, in a race, everybody's running, but only one person gets the prize. And he says this, so run to win. In Paul's times, there were no ribbons for participating. There were no participation ribbons. You know, some people nowadays, they're just glad to get a ribbon for participating. Paul says, no, there's no participation ribbons. He says, you run to win. You give it your all. You act if if there's only one prize. You're not here to participate and get a participation uh, ribbon, but we're here to live by faith. 
First Timothy chapter six, he says, but you, Timothy, are a man of God. He tells him, you're a man of God. So run from all these evil things. He says, pursue righteousness. Talks pursue it. He says, pursue righteousness in a godly life along with faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. And then he tells him this, fight the good fight for the true faith. He tells him to fight. Hold on tightly to the eternal life which God has called you. He's telling him, don't just participate. But he says, pursue these things. Pursue righteousness. Pursue godly living. Pursue faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. Pursue these things and fight for them. 1 Corinthians 9, 25, Paul, again, he's continue on as he's talking about so run to win. He continues, he says, all athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that'll fade away. He's talking about that, that, that crown, that, that, that all right, wreath, amen, that they would wear. Man, I went blank there. The wreath, it would just end, end up just dying off. He says, but we do it for an eternal prize. He talks about later about the crown that God would give him. He says, so run with purpose in every step. Run with purpose. He told Timothy to pursue these things. Now he's saying run with purpose. Run and, 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 and live this life with a vision, with the goal of accomplishing something. Make them count. He says in every step, make them count. Those of you who like to count your steps, amen, it's like you want to make sure you get credit for every step. I'm one short, amen. You step counters. He says to pursue it to have a vision, a goal of accomplishing something, make it count. Because when there's no purpose, when there's no goal, when there's no vision, we find no reason to live by faith. We have no purpose in life. If we have no vision for life, if we have no goals in life, we are not gonna wanna live by faith. Paul continues and he says, I'm not just shadow boxing. He says, I'm not going through the motions. You always see before a fight, you know, they'll show the boxer in his locker room and he's, he's just going at it. He's shadow boxing. He's looking good. He's ducking and weaving and you know, going all fast and that. And they get in the ring, just one punch and they're down. He says, don't be shadow boxing. He says, fight that good fight of faith. Man, fight and pursue these things. Go after these things. Have a vision. He says, run with purpose in every step you take. And then Paul says, I discipline my body like an athlete. Training it, what it should do. He says, I discipline myself like an athlete does. An athlete that's competing, that's trying to win those prizes. I'm training my body to do what it should do, that I would do the right things. After he told Timothy to pursue these things and, and, and to, 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 to run with purpose. See, this young fighter had another fight, again, which he lost. And he admitted, finally, that he came to camp weighing over 300 pounds. He was so undisciplined, unmotivated. He, he admitted, I've taken days off. I ended up losing. But at some point, something clicked in this young man's life. He began to discipline himself. He says he started to train right, began to eat right. He shed the weight. He went from 300 pounds down to about 230, 240. And he went on to have a pretty respectable career. He actually did. He never won a championship, but he had a respectable career. And it was because he decided to discipline himself, to finally say, you know what? I'm going to discipline myself. I'm going to pursue a championship. Paul says, I discipline my body like an athlete, training it what it should do. Otherwise, I fear after preaching to others, I myself might become disqualified. Paul says, I discipline myself because if I'm going to preach, I'm not going to be a guy that just, the type of guy is going to be, do what I say, not as I do. I don't want to start going backwards. I don't want to become a disgrace. I want to discipline myself, dedicate myself. I want to examine myself to make sure I'm living what I'm preaching. That's why he disciplines himself like an athlete, that he wouldn't become disqualified. See, Paul said he lived by faith. 2 Timothy 2.5, athletes cannot win the prize unless they follow the rules. God gives us a rule book, which is his word of God. It's an instruction on how to live, especially to live a life of faith. There's no shortcuts in it. There's no loopholes. Living by faith is living according to the word of God. I remember when one of our early bikeathons is when we would drive, ride through Whittier, come through La Habra, Brea, uh, Yorba Linda. 
And I was riding. I was getting probably between Bray and your Belinda, about maybe 40, 40 miles in. And I got to a stop, and there was a brother there, and I really didn't know him that well. And he comes up to me. He goes, hey, he pulls me to the side. Hey, bro. He goes, I got my truck. If you want, we could throw your bike in my truck, and I'll give you a ride. <laughs> I'm like, what in the world are you talking about? I felt like, Paul, I've disciplined myself. I've trained for this. <laughs> and you just want me to take a shortcut? I could imagine after, oh, we've seen Pastor Bob been in and out, and he had his bike in the back of his brother's truck. Man, he's disqualified. He's disqualified. You know, don't ever ask me to ride, you cheater. Man, take away his medal. How could I look myself in the mirror knowing I cheated? Man, I'd be disgraced. Paul says, I discipline my body like an athlete, training it what it should do. There's a complete transformation of what we were to what God wants us to be. Paul says the reason why is because I don't want to be to come disqualified. I start thinking about this brother. I'm thinking about, man, is this how you really live your life? Honestly? I didn't know him. I didn't say it to him because I really didn't know him. But in my mind, I'm thinking, man, is this really how you live your life? Trying to lie and cheat your way around? You know, it was like no big deal to him. It was like, come on, bro, I'll put it in my bike, man, my truck, bro. I'll, I'll take you back. I'm like, what are we going to do? See, he didn't understand the vision of what we were doing. There was no vision, no purpose behind what he was doing. He was just there. It was no big deal to him. And I thought to myself, man, you're going backwards. You're going backwards. So the way he was just like, you know, no big deal to him. Like, yeah, let's lie, let's cheat, let's do this. To me, I felt like, man, you're going backwards. Hebrews 10, 35, it says, so don't throw away this confident trust in the Lord. Remember the great reward it brings you. Again, he's talking about remember the vision, remember the goal, remember the, your purpose. He says, patient endurance is what you need now so that you will continue to do God's will. He says, to continue to do God's will, then you will receive all that he promised. As we continue to live by faith, as we continue to have that life that's disciplined, he says that we will receive all that he has promised us. For in just a little while, the coming will come and not delay. Talking about Jesus. He says, and my righteous ones will live by faith. And right here he says, but I take no pleasure any, in anyone who turns away. We are not like those who turn away from God to their own destruction. We are the faithful win, ones whose souls will be saved. Living by faith is 365 days a year. There's no days off. There's no cheat days. It's a complete dedication to God and living for him we got to be faith, the faithful ones, as Paul talks about. we got to be those faithful ones whose souls will be saved. Why? Because we lived by faith. Many times we're asked the question, is it possible to live by faith in all the craziness of this world? And I say, yes, it is. It is possible. It is possible to live by faith, even when there's all kinds of craziness and madness going, around, around, going on around us. Hebrews 1.11, as we talked about earlier, faith is a reality of what we hope for. It's the evidence of things we cannot see. Again, we believe God for what we can't see. Again, we walk by faith, not by sight. Hebrews 11.7, it talks about Noah. Basically, a man who's living in a time with all kinds of craziness going on around him. It says in Hebrews 11.7, it was by faith that Noah built a large boat to save his family from the flood. He obeyed God who warned him about things he had ne that had never happened before, which was the flood. He's warning about something he's never seen before. By his faith, Noah condemned the rest of the world and received the righteousness that comes by faith. When we look at the story of Noah in Hebrew, uh, Genesis chapter 6, it talks about God as God observed the human wickedness in the world. He said how every thought of, of humanity was constantly and totally evil. It says that God said he was sorry that he made them. It broke his heart. But God says, I'm going to wipe this human race that I created off the face of the earth because I'm sorry I even made them. But in verse 8, he says, but Noah found favor with the Lord. And verse 9 tells him why. This is the account of Noah and his family. Noah was a righteous man. The only blameless person living on earth in the time. Remember, the earth is filled with just wickedness. And he says he's the only man that was blameless walking in, the, in, in this earth. 
And it says right here, he walked in close fellowship with God. Noah was living by faith. He trusted God. He believed with God. He walked with God. You look at the chapter or the verse right before it, it talks about his great grandfather, which was Enoch. Meaning Enoch also walked with God. In, in Hebrews 11, 5, it says, it was by faith that Enoch was taken up to heaven without dying. He disappeared because God took him. For before he was taken up, he was known as a person who pleased God. Genesis 5 talks about Enoch. He said he lived 365 years walking in close fellowship with God. Talked about Noah, how he walked with God. Talks about his great-grandfather walking in close fellowship with God. Then one day he disappeared because God took him. He was, again, Enoch was living by faith. He trusted God, believed God, and he also walked with God. In Amos chapter 3, in verse 3, it says, Do two walk together unless they have agreed to do? See, if we're going to walk with God and live by faith, then we need to be in full agreement with God. We got to be in full agreement with God and his will for our life and his word for, for, for his word that we got to be in full agreement if we're going to be able to walk with God. You ever been in meetings? I've been in meetings where you're sitting there in a meeting and there's just two individuals that just don't get along. They just don't get along and there is so much tension in that room. There's silence. You know, nothing's getting accomplished because it's just a standoff. They're just staring and it's like nobody's volunteering information. We're just sitting there. It's like, how do we have a meeting where these people don't even get along? We go through walkthroughs on job sites. We'll go through a walkthrough, pre-job meetings. And they're just walking and just taking shots at each other. It doesn't work. Enoch and Noah both walked in close fellowship with God. They lived by faith. Their lives pleased God. They were righteous before him. Why? Because they were in complete agreement with everything God said or instructed. It's just when you walk with someone, you're going to have to be in agreement with them. They were in agreement with God because they walked with God. Let's go back to chapter 6 of Genesis. Again, it talks about um, Noah. How God observed all the corruption in the world. For everyone on this earth was corrupt. Everyone was corrupt. So God said to Noah, I've decided to destroy all living creatures that have filled the earth with violence. Yes, I will wipe them all along with the earth. I'm going to wipe them all out with the, along with the earth. Verse 14, God begins to instruct him. He says, build a large boat from cypress wood, and waterproof it with tar inside and out. Then construct the decks and stalls throughout the interior. God's telling Noah, I want you to build a boat. I'm probably in Noah's mind. He's probably, okay, me and my family, eh, I probably need about a 15 to 20 foot boat, and then that should be sufficient. We'll be good. But God gives him a blueprint and the instructions for this boat. God says, make the boat 450 feet long. A football field is 360 feet long. You're talking about another, another 100 feet he says, make the, the, the boat 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, and 45 feet high. He says, leave an 18-inch opening below the roof all the way around the boat, put the door on the side, and build three decks inside the boat, lower, middle, and upper. If God were to tell us that, I want you to build a boat that's 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, 40 feet, 5 feet high. You say, how in the world am I going to do this, God? I can't even make my bed. How am I going to do this? God gives us a blueprint for life. He gives us his word. As we follow that blueprint and the instructions, it's, it, it's possible to live by faith. Noah didn't panic. Noah didn't allow fear to grip his heart. It says in verse 22 that Noah did exactly as God commanded him. He did everything that God commanded him. Why? Because he was living by faith. He trusted what God had told him. Why? Because he had walked with him. He believed that God's going to accomplish this. God's going to get this done. He's telling me to do it, but he's going to help me to get this done. Despite all that was going around him, you know, because it says everyone on the earth was corrupt. I'm sure people were mocking him. It's like nowadays, probably stealing his tools. We always have tools stolen from job sites. Probably trying to sabotage his work. I don't know if there were taggers on the day. Maybe they were tagging on his, you know, boat there. But Noah continued to live by faith. And he trusted in what God had instructed him. And in chapter 7, as the flood came and, and, and wiped out everything, and it says that, that this, it started to, to, to go down, it says that Noah did everything that the Lord commanded him. Noah was 600 years old when the flood covered the earth. He went on board to escape the flood, he and his wife and his sons and their wives, that God brought his family into that boat. 
in, verse, in chapter 8, it talks about, so Noah and his wife and his sons and their wives left the boat. It was by faith that Noah built a large boat to save his family from the flood. He obeyed God. But, but not only Noah, but it also God saved his entire, fa- his entire family from destruction. As we live by faith, as we walk by, with God, as we have, you know, just trust God for everything, God is going to be there for not only us, but also our family also. See, we need to put it into action. If we're going to live by faith, we need to put that faith into action. In James 2, verse 14, it says, What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? I'm not putting it into action. Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister without clothes and daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, keep warm, well fed, but do, not, but do nothing about their physical needs. What good is it? It's like we see a brother or sister struggling, and it's like, oh, have faith, brother, have faith, sister, God's going to provide, and just let them walk off. So what kind of faith is that? In the same way, faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by our action, it is dead. We can say we have faith for so many things in our lives, but if we don't step out and put our faith in action, the Bible says it is dead, it is worthless. We can have faith for God to do miracles in our lives. We have faith and say, God, I need to move, but if we're not praying, we're not going to see it happen. We have faith for God to build the church, but if we never take our place to serve, faith is dead. We have faith for God to provide, but if we never give, we're robbing God. We have faith that we will grow spiritually, but if we never open his word, there's gonna be no transformation. See, faith without action is dead, it's useless. What if Noah decided to procrastinate, be like this boxer, you know, take a few days off, take the family to get some tacos, you know, let's go get tacos, I know God wants us to do this, what if he procrastinated? What if he just decided not to do it after all? But no, it says Noah did exactly what the Lord asked him. In James 2.20, you foolish person, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled and said, Abraham believed God and was credited to him as righteousness. He was called a fr- God's friend or a friend of God. See, Abraham put his faith into action. When God told him, I want you to take your son up to, to, the, to this place and I want you to sacrifice him to me. Isaac, or Jacob, or Abraham did exactly what God told him to do. And it says that God stopped him right before him because God tested his faith and he knew that he was walking with him. And it says, Because of that, he was called a friend of God because he lived by faith. God will challenge us to step out in faith. He's going to challenge us in so many areas of our lives. Are we going to put it into action because we walk by faith and and walk with God and live by faith? I mean, so many things that God will challenge us in our lives. I remember Pastor Dan came to me one day and said, a couple years ago, and he says, I want to know if you'd like to start preaching on Wednesday nights. And I'm like, man, can't you get Aaron to do it? You know? <laughs> it's not that I want to do it, but I, I, I'm, I just, it's me. I, I just, I, I get, I go through, I go through things, and I'm like, but I knew this was what God wanted for me. I had to just say, you know what, God, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to believe in you. I'm going to walk with you. And I don't say that to say, oh, I was like, oh, man, I, I get nervous. I still get nervous, but God is with me. God helps me. Those that know me, you know, you fellowship with me, you get probably about two, three words out of me. You know, it's like, I don't know what to talk about. People, my wife says, you're so rude. I'm like, why? I don't know what to say. <laughs> and I'm thinking, man, I'm going to get up there. But God, God called me. Pastor Dan just said, you know what? And, and, and I said, okay, I'm, I'll do this. Because I'm walking with faith. I'm believing God, and I know that God will help me. There's areas in your life that God is going to challenge you, that God is going to call you to. God is going to begin to, 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 to say, you know what, you need to begin to do this. And he's going to say, God, am I going to walk with you and live by faith and say, okay, God, here I am. Here's my life. Use it. Or we're going to say, nah, I'm just going to take a couple of days off, think about it, you know, go take the family and get some ta- tacos, you know. <laughs> but God is... It's going to challenge us. And this is the proof if we're really living by faith. 
See, faith is a choice. Faith is acting on what you believe. We need to ask ourselves, am I living out what I believe? The worship team can come up. Spurgeon said, my faith, my faith rests not in what I am or shall be or feel or know. My faith is in Christ and what he has done and what he is doing for me. Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. It's talking about being transformed. It's not me anymore, but it's Christ that lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. God loves us so much that he gave us his son. Jesus loved us that he gave his life. And knowing how much they loved us, you know, and what they've done for us and what he's doing for us, you know, and what he's going to do for us, we can do the same and show our love for him by walking with him and living by faith. It was because of their faith that Enoch and Noah walked with God. It was because of his faith that Abraham was called the friend of God. Tonight, if they were to write our story, begin to write your story, what would it be said of us? If they were to say, I want to write your story, would it be like this young man who began to talk about how undisciplined he was? How he just, you know, wouldn't put in the time that took days off and say, oh, you know, I'll get to it when I get to it. Or are they going to say, that was a brother, that was a sister that walked with God. They lived by faith. There was no days off for them. They disciplined themselves. They, they, they did whatever it was take to seek that prize. They pursued everything that God had for them. Tonight, what is it going to be said of us? Tonight, why don't we bow our heads, close our eyes this evening.